Hello and good evening from Berlin. You are watching the 16th session of United We Talk. Today we will present you the report Remote Control, the EU-Libya collaboration in mass interceptions of migrants in the central Mediterranean. My name is Sara. I'm a member of Borderline Europe. We do human rights. We monitor and report on human rights violation at the EU's external borders. And I will guide you through the evening together with Matthias, I'm uh, from uh, SILIP, which is a German magazine on police issues, like uh, SILIP is an abbreviation for uh, civil liberties and police. Over the past five years, at least 15,000 people are said to have lost their lives in the Mediterranean. Remote Control, the report we are launching today, explains how the European Union is responsible for this deadly regime on the Mediterranean by supporting the so-called Libyan Coast Guard for pullbacks to Libya. The report is written by four organizations, the Alarm Phone, Mediterranean and Sea-Watch, as well as Borderline Europe. It provides detailed reconstructions of three search and rescue events that happened in 2019. And those are emblematic for the European border regime that has prompted the return of tens of thousands of people to the Libyan torture camps. And we will have uh, two short films that will explain the search and rescue activities uh, performed by different actors in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, in the Central Met. These are the Coast Guards and the Rescue Coordination Centers and the EU missions, like uh, military. We will show how these European assets are deployed as kind of aerial surveillance for the Libyan Coast Guard. And these EU airplanes, they detect the migrant boats and pass this information to the Libyans are therefore also responsible for the pushbacks. So we call them pushback by proxy or pullbacks. We will explain that later. And uh, we kind of also use the word uh, refoulement. And this is like how the European Union is uh, also responsible. Mm -hmm. We will spend this evening with five lovely guests who are experts on these issues. We have Kiri Santa from the Alarm Phone, Lucia Gennari from Mediterranean, Berenice Godin from Sea-Watch, Sally Hayden who reported about Libya for, Lib uh, for several media outlets as a journalist, and Yasha Mekaniko from the British civil rights organization State-Watch. We are happy that Berenice will be in the studio with us later on while Yasha is in Bristol, Kiri and Lucia are in Rome and Sally is in Uganda. So we will see you on Jitsi in a while. Of course, we also have a set of demands that we will present to you throughout the evening. And uh, one of the main demands is like we want an end to any collaboration with the Libyan authorities, with the Libyan Coast Guard uh, mainly. And we and the organizations we stand for, we fight for the establishment of safe routes for flight so that all these uh, reformers, pushbacks uh, are not necessary anymore. We fight for the freedom of movement to all uh, as a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. In accordance with our demands, we will also have a small music contribution from Mal LV with a song calling for ferries instead of Frontex. And after the song, you will have the chance to ask questions during the chat. You can ask the questions also during the show already, and we will answer them here later on. Um, you can find the chat on the Sea Watch website, where you're also probably watching this um, contribution now. And to the end of the show, we will have contributions from some German initiatives. Those who regularly watch United We Talk maybe know already the show with a cat, which brings scratchy transnational news about COVID-19 and delivers stories around the current pandemic, hosted by CoView Studios. And after that, 
like always in United We Talk, you will hear from Covu19. They will talk about the political and social impact of the current pandemic. Then we switch to German language, to Logbuch Freiheit, which is uh, in English, uh, Logbuch uh, Freedom. And they are dealing in this issue, uh, in this um, session with the surveillance of refugees, mobile phones by German asylum authorities. I am happy to welcome our first guest now, Kiri Santa. You are a member of the Alarm Phone, a transnational group of activists who receives distress calls from the Mediterranean Sea, also from the Aegean Sea, since 2014. You are also a researcher and familiar with the EU policies that lead to the situation we have been witnessing and scandalizing for too many years. Kiri, I hope you are with us already. Okay, there you are. Hi. Can you tell us more about the report you want to present today and the cooperation with the other organizations involved? Yes, hi, thanks a lot um, for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. So, like you said, this report was written by four organizations that are present at sea or active in and around uh, the Mediterranean. So that's Alarm Phone, Sea Watch, Mediterranea and Borderline Europe. And I'd say that the particularity of this report is that it's really based on direct observations um, of, of rights violations um, that take place at sea. Um, and we analyze data collected from, um, from Sea-Watch's um, airborne uh, mission, but also data from Mediterranea um, uh, when they were present at sea, and of course um, information from the alarm phone, which comes directly from people who call the hotline when they're at distress at, um, at sea. And uh, so we decided to come together to write this report uh, because we realized that the, Lib the creation of the Libyan SAR zone gave the kind of new formal legitimacy to the Libyan Coast Guard in the sense that this, um, this uh, Coast Guard became responsible for the coordination of a huge area of international waters, despite the fact that um, it's well known uh, and it's been reported that the Libyan Coast Guard uh, has overlapping ties with militias who are involved in all sorts of uh, criminal activities. And um, increasingly, we were observing that, uh, that uh, NGOs present at sea, organizations present at sea, were not getting all the information about distress cases and that pullbacks to Libya um, were increasing and that this was due to uh, coordination by EU aerial assets um, and so who were spotting fleeing boats and then feeding that information to the Coast Guard to the Libyan Coast Guard, who was then bringing them back to, to Libya. And of course, these practices remain uh, widespread, widespread today. So we decided together to write this report to uh, denounce these practices. Mm -hmm. I assume this is why you called the report remote control, because you're speaking about the EU aerial assets that are present at sea, and that I connecting these to the Libyan Coast Guard, as far as I understand from your description. Can you also explain which other actors are involved in the Central Mediterranean? Yeah, of course. So um, aside from NGOs, organizations present at sea who are conducting um, rescues, there are several uh, actors who are involved in the policing of the Europeans' uh, external mm -hmm. border. And so, of course, the most obvious is, is Frontex, um, which has its operation. Its operation is known as the uh, Timis, but um, they are only patrolling a zone a uh, very limited zone, which is 24 nautical miles off of the of European coast. So most of their activities are um, are largely limited to surveillance. Um, then we also uh, have different military actors, so um, that also we describe in the reports. We have the armed Maltese forces, uh, the Italian um, military, uh, and then Uniform Med which is the European military uh, operation, which is active in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, okay, and thank you very much, Kiri. This was a very broad picture already that you're giving us. We will speak now about, you mentioned already the ZAR zones, and we will discuss that further on with our next guest. Yeah, we now have uh, Yasha from Statewatch uh, from it, uh, Italy, like he's now living in Bristol. Hey. In its key finding, the report Remote Control explains how the EU aerial assets are in fact like acting as uh, aerial surveillance for the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. The four organizations in the report accuse the EU actors of violating international law by facilitating interceptions like 
as uh, mentioned before, pullbacks, pushbacks. Yasha, as a member of the British Civil Rights Organization State Watch, you researched and wrote a lot about uh, these issues. Could you please give us a brief explanation what is that uh, search and rescue zone? Yes, the search and rescue... Hi, thanks for inviting me. Hi, Mathieu. Um, a search and rescue zone, or SAR zone, is an area designated as being the responsibility of a coastal state regarding cooperation of maritime uh, SAR operations. The 19... 79 convention, which was last amended in 2004, requires state parties to set up SAR services that fulfill certain requirements, providing operational coordination to carry out this function effectively. A SAR zone has a specific size. It is associated to a Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, mm -hmm. that's MRCC, to provide and coordinate SAR services. Having a search and rescue zone does not mean that the responsible, responsible state has a monopoly on SAR operations, but it must have a coordination center to manage distress calls, communicate with SAR assets and with other um, countries' um, coordination centers. Yasha, If we it have can a map. help... Yasha? Let, let, let us yeah. show the map. Um, we have a map of the SAR zones in the central Mediterranean, and perhaps you can explain a little bit uh, the, the different SAR zones. Can we have the map, so the SAR map? Like, uh, there is the Tunisian one, uh, the Italian one, the Maltese, and of course the Libyan uh, SAR zone. Where's the map? Yeah. There. Could you explain a bit, uh, like, uh, how they are handled? Yes, well, the central Mediterranean is a very peculiar context because there's a, there are several countries involved, but uh, Italy had taken charge of the bulk of SAR activities, at least until 2015, notably during the Mare Nostrum operation that was uh, ended after pressure from the EU and member states in October 2014. You see that Malta has a very large SAR zone, which means that there may be cases in which vessels may be in danger in multi SAR waters, but it may be easier and quicker for Italian rescue assets to intervene. The Libyan SAR zone was established recently to allow EU states to relinquish their responsibilities, but it is hard to conceptualize it as anything other than a fiction through which states have used the IMO's declaratory procedure to circumvent their obligations. What are the these, key points, uh, Yasha, what are these obligations? So, as a last question, we will get to you uh, later, uh, back to you later on that, but can you briefly explain what are the obligations of the IMO, the Maritime Organization uh, for an MRCC? For an, there, needs to be, uh, there needs to be a functioning um, coordination center There needs, there needs to be, the most important thing in the whole SAR convention is that rescues are defined as an operation to retrieve persons in distress, provide for their initial medical and other needs, and deliver them to a place of safety. Now that's the main problem, because Libya can never be defined as a place of safety. There are well-documented reasons for it, and apart from that, in relation to the what the, IOL, the IMO needs in order for there to be a, a proper SAR zone. Libya does not have a yeah. state authority that is in control of the whole territory. Yeah. So the Libyan Coast Guard is not a unified body, but there are a series of local commands. Yeah, yeah, that's, and some that's of them the... act with interests that are contrary to each other. And as uh, Kiri said, there is membership of... Yeah, let us, let us switch a bit. Uh, we will hear now about uh, the, the legal issues, um, like uh, later with our next guest. But first, uh, we will have uh, the first video, like of our first case, case one. It happened on the 10th of April uh, last year, when the Italian MRCC, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, refused to take uh, coordination responsibility. And the alarm phone retrieved the GPS position and passed it to the aircraft Moonbird. The Moonbird is an uh, aircraft uh, like a plane from Sea Watch uh, Airborne Department. 
Italy then uh, referred this emergen uh, emergency case to the Libyans, to the Libyan Coast Guard, and this delayed the rescue for over 12 hours. And take a look at this uh, six-minute film. Marcy Ciron, duty officer speaking. Good morning. Good morning, sir. This is Elias, an officer for Moonbird speaking. And I wanted to ask if you have any um, open cases that you might need assistance with. Um, at the moment, there is one uh, case under the coordination of Libyan uh, authority. Do you know if the Libyan Coast Guard is active with the current war in Tripoli? Can they send any help? At the moment, I don't have uh, this information. I repeat, uh, I'm in, we are in contact. We are still yes. waiting uh, another call from them. Okay. And, and that's it. Thank you, Thank Lord. You. Goodbye. Bye-bye. We have a distress case, boat in distress. I'm sorry, I speak English. Um, anyone who speaks English? Is there anyone who speaks English? Calling the number we received from Rome. No reply. Calling the um, official MRCC number. Apparently busy. Calling Tripoli Port Authority. And uh, not functioning. Trying once again Tripoli Port Authority. <sighs> not possible to inform JRCC Libya about the distress case that Boombert has just spotted. Bodenkontakt für das Flugzeug, das Suchflugzeug von Sea-Watch. Und Aha. wir haben einen ähm, ähm, Seenotfall. Äh, genau, und diese Geschichte getroffen. stellen wir auch rüber. Ja, ähm, wir erreichen halt niemanden in Libyen. Wir versuchen Ja, das, halt, ist, das ist klar, dass sie niemanden in Libyen erreichen. Wenn der Bürgerkrieg ist, dann, dann, dann hat man leider das Problem. Na? Duty officer speaking at Marcy Rome. Good afternoon, sir. Good this afternoon. is Amazon officer from Moonbird speaking yes. again. And we wanted to know from you if you have any new information for us. Please be aware that on area there is uh, at least another air asset. Uh, it should be a uniformed uh, air asset. The, the air asset is uh, 
works for military organizations, so I don't know the reason for which it is there. Oh, okay. uh, I just, uh, I'm just telling you, I repeat, for a safety reason, that there, there is uh, an error set. Okay, but you didn't, you didn't inform Final Format as MRCC? Everyone is aware about the situation, but uh, as you should know, uh, Libya is very far from uh, our station, so uh, for MRCC, ro for Italian uh, uh, radio station, it's not possible to reach that distance from uh, Italian coast. So other MRCC are involved in this case, are informed, and uh, are broadcasting uh, uh, in the information. On behalf of the Libyan yeah. authority, an update was broadcast. Okay, thank you for preparing that video for us. We will come back to Kiri in a bit, but Berenice just reached our studio. Welcome. We will talk to you a little bit later. And now I'm getting back to Kiri. I hope you are uh, in the Jitsi already. Um, we would like you to explain a little bit what we just saw in the video, which aircrafts were involved, which rescue coordination centers. Maybe you can explain the case in more detail. Sure. Um, so this was the first case that we analyzed in our report. Um, and what, I, what is really striking in this case is that from the moment that the alert uh, is given to the authorities that there's a boat in distress to the moment that a rescue, or in this case interception, is carry out, carried out, it takes more than 12 hours, despite the fact that there were merchant or commercial ships close by who could have intervened much sooner. Um, and so what you can maybe understand also from the video is that it seems like the Italian Maritime Coordination Center um, has privileged means of reaching uh, the coordination center in Tripoli because both the alarm phone and Moonbird try repeatedly uh, to, to reach um, the Libyan Coast Guard without uh, success. And so what this also means is that it should be the Italian Maritime Coordination Center taking a responsibility for coordination for the rescue, since no one else is responding, um, in the case of in the in the video, so you see that um, the Italians in, uh, confirm that they have sent out a NAV text message uh, on behalf of the Libyans. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it should be stressed here that uh, uh, it's the duty of a maritime rescue coordination center to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and to be manned by English-speaking staff. So here again, we see that this whole Libyan SAR zone is supposedly coordinated by, um, by the Libyan or the, the JRCC Tripoli, um, but this is not functioning at all. Mm -hmm. You uh, just saw one of our demands, the immediate revocation of the Libyan SAR zone. Can you explain, you mentioned this before, was this a pushback or a pullback? And you were referring to the different SAR zones, explaining like where is the case happening? Yeah, so this is happening in the Libyan SAR zone, and we call it a pullback because mm -hmm. uh, the, the distress case ended in an interception, so uh, the Libyans arrived on scene and pulled the people back to Libya. And what you also see in the video is that there are two um, uniformed uh, aircrafts, 
that are present on scene, um, that are fully aware that this is happening, and seemingly there is communication happening between them and um, the Libyans who are then guided, who are able to come to the point where the distress case is happening, um, and this takes a long time, and the other commercial vessels which could carry out a, uh, a rescue are not um, involved. And of course we can um, suppose that this is because um, the Italians also know that if a European flagged vessel or a commercial ship were to bring people back to Libya, this is in violation of the non refoulement uh, principle, um, and there's a risk that if the people were rescued by these commercial ships, they would be um, brought to Europe. So what happens is that uh, they continually repeat that the coordination is under Libyan coordination, and then wait until the Libyan Coast Guard arrives a very long time after the first alert is given to then pick the people up and bring them back to Libya. Thank you very much, Kiri, for this detailed report. We also have a second case that we documented um, in the launch that we are showing today that we will discuss together with Berenice. The case occurred on the 23rd of May last year. Berenice, you work for the advocacy team at Sea-Watch and you also have a law degree. Also, you participated yourself in surveillance flights from the Sea-Watch Air Airborne Department. We saw the aircrafts in the video and we heard a lot about it. Can you tell us more since when Sea-Watch has aircrafts in addition to rescue ships? And mm -hmm. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, Sea-Watch uh, has an an aircraft, so Airborne exists since 2017, and we operate one aircraft, Moonbird, uh, together with our partner, Humanitarian Pilots Initiative, um, since 2017, and we have a second aircraft since uh, this year, Seabird. Okay, and why is it important for you to have your own air surveillance? We already heard about European actors having a lot of aircrafts around. Well, NGO Sea Rescue NGOs are known for rescuing people at sea with vessels. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that vessels are very slow and don't provide us any full overview of the current situation in the central Mediterranean. And as you mentioned, a lot of the other stakeholders, mm -hmm. as Frontex or Operation Sofia, now Irini, mainly... This is from the Uniformat mission. Just exactly. And mainly operate with the airplanes. And uh, to that extent, we had, we thought that, in, and in order to be fast, um, we, yes, developed this project uh, to operate with one airplane, with the aim to document human rights violations at sea, and also, of course, spot cases and alert the authorities when we spot any case. Mm -hmm. This is also why we demand an end to the EU aerial surveillance, right? Okay, so maybe you can explain us a little bit how an airborne mission functions and also relate to the video that we will see in a few minutes. So as I mentioned, we operate um, our aircrafts together with our partner Humanitarian Pilot Initiative. Mm -hmm. They provide us pilots mm -hmm. and we in the aircraft we also have one person taking care of their strategy, where to fly during, for each mission and another pay, person um, documenting the cases and the human rights violations. And uh, we also have people from the land uh, in constant exchange with uh, the back office, of course, with the aircraft and with uh, the authorities. Mm -hmm. And this leads us is, to this uh, third case, uh, the 23rd of May. So I was a spotter that day, so I do remember it uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, we were aware of, um, of a distress case, um, thanks to alarm phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we flew to the given position, uh, we also had spotted that uh, an Italian military vessel. Mm -hmm. And when we arrived on scene, we decided to send out a two Mayday relays, requesting any vessels in the area to intervene. Nobody answered. Mm -hmm. We decided then to fly above um, this military Italian military vessel. And they never answered, re never replied to our Mayday relay. And even though we told them that they were breaking the law in denying to rescue people at sea, they refused. And when we actually came back to the distress case, that's how they actually answered on the radio and told us that they, a patrol boat, a Libyan patrol boat was approaching the case and that they would assist them uh, with a helicopter. 
So clearly, they rather delegate their obligation to render assistance to people at sea in distress um, to the Libyans rather than rescuing themselves and bringing the people back to a place of safety. Thank you very much. Um, we will watch this video now. We have to warn you, there are people actually in the water um, and it will take around six minutes and then we come back to you. Good afternoon, sir. This is Air Liaison Officer for Calibri speaking. Yes, good afternoon. Robert. I've just sent you uh, an email um, on behalf of Distress Case 09. Um, did you copy the position and did you copy that people are in the water, the tubes are totally deflated, the boat is no longer moving and people are holding on to the tubes? Did you get that message? No, I, I didn't. I haven't received this message. Please repeat me. Okay. The situation? Yes. Um, there is a rubber boat. Yeah, I know that there is a rubber boat, but what is the news? The tubes are totally deflated. Our aircraft has sent a Mayday relay on behalf of this rubber boat. And the next vessel in the vicinity of this distress case is Italian military vessel P492, Comandante Bettica. Do you have any any communication means with this? Can you call no, them? No, 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 madam. Please uh, uh, send me again the email, please, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. during the rescue 
operation. Italian warship Papa 4992. I copied. Libyan Coast Guard is approaching the district cave and you will launch a helicopter to assist Libyan Coast Guard. Berenice, we just saw in the video that the Italian Navy vessel Commandante Betica just left the scene. So they let the people alone, they left it uh, to the Libyans to bring them back. So could you please uh, explain a little bit uh, like uh, which, uh, which violations uh, committed uh, the Italians, like the commander of this ship, like which regulations, laws um, did they violate? Well, there are two aspects in this case. First, the fact that uh, the Commandante Bitica refused to render assistance to people at sea. And second, the fact that they assist the, this Libyan patrol boat with a helicopter. On the first aspect, uh, the, the in international law, it's, the international law clearly states that um, there is this duty to render assistance at sea. And this is in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, the, the um, International Convention on Search and Rescue, International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea. So these three um, conventions really say that a, when there is a person in distress, the shipmaster should uh, yes, render assistance to the per persons in distress. And the second... Um, and then, so this, this is an international law, and this is also enshrined in each national law, and especially in Italian law, and a captain refusing to render, refusing to render assistance to people at sea could face criminal charges, in especially. So these uh, regulations, or these conventions that you now uh, mentioned are um, conventions like uh, of the sea for captains, but there is also the, the human rights aspect like of the international laws. Yes, indeed, um, international human rights law applied at sea. Um, this means that a state must respect international human rights law and also the European Convention on Human Rights, for example, and principles uh, such as the principle of non-refoulement, which, which say, stated that a person should not be expelled to a country um, where he or she could face torture or he, he, his or her life could be threatened. Um, yes, so this is the principle of non-refoulement. And uh, it applies at sea. And Italy has already been um, condemned by the European Court of Human Rights, for in which they had um, an Italian military vessel had rescued people at sea and brought them back to um, Libya. It was and a direct pushback. No, I think the, exactly. the verdict was in 2012. Exactly, Hirsi Jama, and there is a current pending case. Um, in which actually Italy um, supported, uh, assist the, a Libyan patrol boat in interception with a helicopter. So the exact same case is pending in front of the European mm -hmm. Court of Human Rights. And so would you consider this as a pushback or a pullback? Could you explain this uh, difference? So, this is a pullback, but facilitated by Italy, in which they provided... The helicopter. Yeah, exactly, the helicopter. Yeah. 
Um, like we saw that the people fell into the water and they were then picked up, uh, so those who survived um, by the Libyan Coast Guard and brought back. Do you know what happened to them afterwards? No, we don't. I, we assume they had been brought back to a de de Libyan detention center, but we don't have any contact mm -hmm. with them. Thank you very much, Berenice, for giving us this impression also on the, the legal aspects of this. We will start talking to Lucia now. Lucia, you are a lawyer and also part of the legal team of Mediterranean. You've also been part of writing the report and you especially focused on the rights violations enacted by EU institutions that Berenice also just explained to us. There was another case in the report that we will not show here, but maybe you can briefly explain what it was about, when it happened and who was involved. Hello, and thanks uh, also for my part from, for being here. Yes, there is another case explained in the report, um, which uh, happened uh, in, on the 2nd of May 2019 and involved the several actor, actors, as it uh, often happens. Uh, in this case, there were uh, at least two uh, air assets, one from Unit for Med and another one from AFM, so the uh, uh, Maltese Army. And both the Maltese and the Italian MRCC, so the coordination centers, were uh, aware of the situation. Uh, this is an emblematic case uh, for what we say in the re report because it shows two key points uh, of the dynamic and effects uh, of the EU externalization policies, which are in particular the fact that um, the air surveillance and the coordination uh, which happened, for example, in this case, as I will uh, tell you, um, by the European authorities of the Libyan uh, assets uh, actually is essential for the uh, interception and final pullback, pull or pushback uh, uh, of people in Libya. And the second really important point is that the res European responsibility also comes from supporting financially and also technically uh, mm -hmm. the Libyan called Libyan authorities. For example, in this case, the interception was made with uh, a patrol boat, which was a former Guardia di Finanza uh, patrol boat, so mm -hmm. an Italian provided by the Italian government to the Libyans. Uh, what happened? In this case, um, uh, as it was confirmed to the Marionio ship uh, mm -hmm. by the Italian MRCC, uh, two migrant boats were spotted by uh, European assets. Uh, in this case, we saw that there was uh, Seagull 19 from Unit for Med and an asset from the Maltese Army, and um, contact, which contacted the competent uh, authorities. What does it mean? Since the uh, events were taking place in the so-called Libyan Star Zone, um, the European authorities uh, formally applies uh, the, the rules of, uh, of international law of the sea. So uh, without taking into consideration the fact that informing only the Libyan authority means uh, that people are systematically brought back to Libya, mm -hmm. where we will see what, uh, what happens to people uh, who are brought back uh, to Libya. Mm -hmm. Um, mean, they, they, um, they, they use this formal application uh, of uh, law of the sea. Also in this case, uh, it's important to say that there were uh, also humanitarian ships. There was uh, uh, the Mare Ionio, which was available uh, to intervene if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mare Ionio, the ship from Mediterranean, as we will see. Um, and as I was saying, uh, the fact that um, the European airplanes only communicated to the Libyans the place of the, of the, the position of the two, of the two migrant boats uh, made, made possible for the um, Libyan patrol boat, former Italian one, uh, to intercept both, uh, both uh, boats and brought all the, bring all the people back, uh, back to Libya. Thank you very yeah. much, Lucia. You mentioned already the Mare Ionio. This is the ship of Mediterranean that you acquired during the time when Salvini was the Minister of Interior. You, he gained a lot of fame or un, unfame for blocking the ports in Italy and for criminalizing search and rescue NGOs. You wanted to challenge Salvini and you became a very strong movement. Can you explain a little bit how, how you managed to do that? Mm, yeah, Mediterranean is uh, a platform made by different uh, organizations and individuals with very different backgrounds, 
which started to be active uh, at sea after summer 2018, which was a very peculiar summer, as you know, and was able to be present at sea with the ship, the Mare Ionio, um, which is flagging an Italian flag, and uh, with the aim to monitor what was happening in the central Mediterranean in terms also of violation of uh, human rights uh, of migrants, and in case uh, necessary also to intervene, and in fact uh, there had been several rescues during, uh, during this time. Um, we call this, uh, it's not an NGO, uh, we call this an NGA, uh, that means uh, non-governmental action, mm -hmm. and this comes from uh, the idea that the Mediterranean uh, back then, and from, from uh, some months already, and for maybe years, had become a political field where uh, European governments were playing uh, their uh, their games, let's say, but this was putting uh, life, lives of migrants even more at risk than they were, and they were causing a uh, loss of lots of lives, as, as you said before. Uh, so also doing humanitarian activities at sea back then, and also now more than ever, uh, means uh, that uh, to, 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 um, uh, to do, uh, political uh, a political action mm -hmm. too. Uh, humanitarian action started to have a stronger political meanings, and Italy, uh, as you know, plays a very crucial role mm -hmm. in the uh, European policies of management of uh, migration at sea. And, Thank you. Uh, they this is a very okay. very good description of how we should take action against all these. Um, things that are happening that we are describing here. We will see a very short video from a protest in Bologna that was organized by a group from Mediterranea. Can you just quickly, quickly explain to us what the protest was about? Yeah, so um, uh, the protest uh, was held uh, on the 2nd of February uh, this year. It was the anniversary of the Memorandum of Understanding between Italy and Libya. And uh, it's, um, it's one part of all the activities that the uh, Mediterranean does also, does also uh, on land. Mm -hmm. Because we try to connect, uh, our, our aim is also to connect a lot um, uh, activities at sea with what happens on land. And we have these land crews uh, that uh, are doing many kinds of activities from protests to um, solidarity activities, especially, for example, this happened in, during the pandemic. Uh, um, when, when we uh, were very active in cities, uh, doing uh, medical, psychological support, social assistance, and so on. In this case, uh, you will see a protest in front of Eni, which is a famous, very well-known Italian oil company, um, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, very based in Libya. And uh, thank you very much, Lucia. Um, fortunately, we really need to see the video now. We are so curious. Um, it's also inspiring to listen to. This is not only an information event; it's also a call for action. So take this as an inspiration to go out on the streets. We will see the video now. Sally, good evening uh, to you in Uganda. As a journalist and photographer, you focus on uh, migration, conflict, uh, humanitarian crisis, 
and you follow the, the situation in Libya. We saw in the last video how protesters in Italy demand the suspension of any collaboration with the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. And from Berenice, we also heard kind of the legal situation, like uh, the, violation, the violation of the different uh, conventions. And uh, we now want to shift our perspective like to Libya. What happens uh, when the refugees are pushed or pulled back uh, to Libya? So how does it look like? Where do they end up? So um, I think it's important to understand that this is part of a loop. So most of the people who are being intercepted at sea, they're basically caught in a loop where they go out to sea, they get intercepted by the Coast Guard, they get brought back, uh, usually they're put in detention centers, so a network of detention centers. Then they either pay their way out or they're um, sold out by the guards there. Then they end up going back to sea. And so it's kind of this desperate cycle um, and in terms of the detention centers that they end up in, I mean, you've spoken a bit about them already, but they're really horrific, like hundreds of people crammed in together, not enough food, not enough water, not enough hygiene, um, you know, not enough medical care, extortion, exploitation, um, abuse, violence, torture, deaths, like everything you can imagine. Yeah, I mean, uh, we here in Germany, we have this leaked uh, cable from the, uh, the German uh, Foreign Office where a diplomat called this situation, like he compared it uh, uh, with concentration camps that caused like a little bit of attention uh, here in Germany. Like how many det detention centers uh, do you count in Libya? Is it known? So how many exist and who is running them? And I'm also wondering like, uh, do they exist only in uh, the Western part or also in the Eastern part? Uh, for those who are not familiar, there's the civil war at the moment between like, to cut it short, between the West and the East. Um, so who is running these detention centers and where are they? So the number is really fluid because they get closed down, they get opened again. Um, some are registered, some aren't registered. There are, I think at the moment, 11 associated with the GNA, so the Tripoli-based government. Um, I'm not sure how many are in the West, and I don't think there's as much of an understanding of, or sorry, in the East. How, I don't think there's the same understanding of that. Um, but then there are also unofficial detention centers, so detention centers run by smugglers that have no official oversight at all. But it's worth saying that even the ones that are associated with the GNA, the Tripoli-based government, they, um, you know, they're run by militias, so they don't necessarily have mm. the same oversight either. No. And uh, many refugees in Libya hope for the resettlement. Could you explain, uh, like resettlement to Europe, to Europe uh, could you explain briefly the re concept of resettlement and what are the chances uh, of this happening for the refugees? Yeah, so I mean, the refugees that I speak to, refugees and asylum seekers, what they're looking for really is to have their case heard. So if they were in a country like a European country, they'd have a right to protection you know they'd have a right to have their claims heard and then be given protection but because they're in Libya they're hoping to have the UN refugee agency evacuate them and the UN um, refugee agency they can only evacuate a bit over 2,000 a year this was before the pandemic so now it's much less obviously like it's on hold so uh, yeah the chances are tiny yeah, I mean, the latest uh, numbers that I read are that like two and a half thousand people in total uh, benefited for, from the program, but there are, of course, many more who need, uh, um, who really need uh, protection or shelter, of course. Um, perhaps a few words about the detention center in Tajura. So this was uh, um, an incident the 2nd of July last year when it was hit uh, um, in the midnight uh, by an airstrike. Could you explain a bit what happened there? Yeah, so um, for me, this incident like really epitomizes the challenges that people are facing and, and the kind of horrors that they can be exposed to. So um, the anniversary is coming up soon. It was 2nd of July that evening. Uh, a detention center was hit by an airstrike. They were actually using it to store weapons nearby to where, um, sorry, to where people were. And that got hit. 53 people at least got killed. 
And most of those people, from what I know, they haven't even been identified yet. So their families haven't been told. We don't know who they were. Um, and yeah, it's just really horrific. And there is uh, the anniversary, like in, what is it, two weeks? Uh, is there anything planned, or you yeah. know? I don't think so, because most of the survivors that I speak to, they're still in Libya, and the pandemic is obviously on. They don't have freedom of movement. They can't reach each other. They're so worried about their immediate needs, and they're still calling for help, but I don't think that they've been able to organize anything. Thank you very much, Sally, for stressing the urgent need for evacuation and resettlement from Libya. Obviously, your description of the situation goes hand in hand with our demands. We want the EU institutions to immediately stop violating basic principles of humanity by ignoring distress cases and pushing people back or pulling people back to Libya. We will come back to Lucia now. Lucia, as we already said, you are a representative of Mediterranean and your rescue ship Marion. You just started again with the rescue mission as well as Sea Watch. The cases in the report we're talking about, they mostly involve Italian authorities, but also Malta, as you mentioned in the Marionio case, is establishing new collaborations with Libya that we have seen in the last weeks. And we even observe pushbacks from the Maltese search and rescue zone, which obviously is now kind of justified by the pandemic, but as we see in the cases has already been happening last year. Can you elaborate on the current situation and refer also to Malta? Yes, um, I would like to uh, stress the fact that uh, the pandemic uh, has been used and, and, sh and has shown us a, a radicalization of the practices that uh, we described uh, in the report and, and an increasing hostile attitude, especially by the Maltese authorities. Um, uh, to summarize a bit the, the latest events, uh, after Italy declared uh, on the 7th of April the that East ports were had to be considered unsafe because of the uh, emergency of the COVID. Malta followed immediately, and um, while uh, in this period, both countries were uh, um, deleting a lot, uh, their, delaying a lot uh, their their intervention, uh, refusing to take direct action with the uh, state ships to avoid uh, the physical contact uh, that has been described and would uh, lead to the responsibility for the disembarkation. Um, we saw that uh, there were days where, uh, entire days where uh, the Italian and the Maltese um, uh, coordination centers uh, just didn't take any action. Uh, Malta increased this uh, level of non-intervention being actually active. Uh, when they uh, used, in at least two cases, uh, private vessels uh, in order to uh, bring people back uh, uh, to, to Libya. In one case, um, uh, fishing vessels flying a Libyan flag but based uh, in Malta. Uh, more recently, uh, they ordered uh, an Italian, uh, Portuguese uh, flag ship to uh, bring people back to Libya, uh, people who uh, were rescued by, by them. Finally, um, they obliged uh, um, several hundreds of people, like more than 400, uh, to stay in, uh, on board uh, touristic vessels, uh, Maltese touristic vessels, uh, before uh, being disembarked to negotiate with Europe uh, their redistribution. And finally, they signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with the Libyan uh, authorities in order to create joint uh, coordination center, formally to combat illegal migration, but uh, actually to deal with sarcasis in the Mediterranean in a way that is uh, even more uh, coordinated and, and, and yeah, coordinated than, uh, than before. So we will see because there has okay. been a joint uh, rescue coordination center before, so would you see that as a new escalation of the situation and looking on the cases from last year that we are discussing here, how can we use the documentation that we are presenting here for future, for a prevention of future cases to happen like this or for other memorandum of understanding to come into place? I think it's important uh, to um, put uh, to have the attention raised on these uh, kind of cases because um, they show the effects of what happens, which are the results 
of uh, these the, the European externalization policies in concrete and on uh, specific people. Uh, there are already uh, several uh, juridical cases pending in front of uh, internal and international courts. One was mentioned before by Berenice, but there are others. Uh, and the aim is to uh, show this connection between what happens in Libya to, to migrants who are pushed back um, and uh, European responsibilities in terms of supporting and making this possible through the um, fin financement and also the direct coordination, uh, as we showed in the report. Uh, so we hope that uh, uh, this kind of responsibility, which is political and also juridical, can be um, established also through this kind of... Um, of uh, reports and, and in case legal actions that will follow uh, to, to this, uh, to the information published in, uh, in the report. Thank you very much, Lucia. Now we will come back to Yasha to discuss further on what is going on with the Tsar region and we talk to you later. Yeah, thank you very much. Yasha, you are uh, our last uh, interview now, so um, perhaps uh, if you wonder why we wrap it up, like uh, it's not only a stream, we are sitting in a TV studio and we have a tight uh, schedule. Um, so as we uh, often repeated our demands like an end to any collaboration with the Libyan authorities to end to suspend the EU aerial surveillance for the Libyans, but uh, at the end, what about the Libyan search and rescue zone? So how should the future handling of this uh, region in the Mediterranean might look like? What do you think? Is there sound on Yasha? Yasha, you are muted. Can you unmute your microphone? We can't hear you at the moment. And please start again because we didn't hear you. Sorry about that. Uh, your, your, your claims are absolutely correct. And uh, the Libyan star zone needs to be struck off international maritime records as a matter of urgency. It's a fiction. They don't have the assets. They don't have the communication relays. They, 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 they often don't answer the stress calls. So it's a, it's a matter of urgency. But more importantly, it's a fiction. It's a fiction, but it has a very strong transformative function because it means that states... <laughs> uh, ...wanting to dismantle basic principles of the law of the sea using some their own power through an exercise of interinstitutional disloyalty. Because, so you are right to demand an end to collaboration with the Libyan Coast Guards. And the first and most important step is to revoke this uh, SAR zone. States are misusing a declaratory procedure to undermine the law of the, the sea and to introduce a systematic misreading of the law of the sea. Because nationality should not be relevant, but Mediterranean had to be set up because they were attacking people for being German or for being or open arms for being Spanish in relation to the people who were being disembarked in Italy. People cannot be taken where they will be abused, but it's becoming a systematic practice. And we have evidence in the documentation that Frontex was involved, the commission is involved, but as a journalist, I contacted them and said this, and they said neither the commission nor Frontex have any responsibility for SAR operations, which is true because it's the country which is uh, the leader of the operation which is responsible. And finally, states must help rescue crews to end their mission swiftly somewhere safe. And Libya is not safe. So uh, there's a, a number of things. And for the future of the SAR zone, the problem is Another one, and it's linked to your claims, is that about freedom of movement and the attempt to stop people who really need to move from traveling, which will never work because they've been trying for 30 years. So, before talking about the SAR zone, the question is, how can it be possible that people who could take planes, who could take ferries, are actually paying lots of money 
to travel in ways that the trips are longer than they used to be hundreds of, year, hundreds of years ago, before mankind had invented so many things. So uh, I think it's a question of how migration policies are causing damage beyond their scope to undermine uh, progress that the human race has made. And human rights are a crucial part of that. Thank you very much for, this, uh, for these uh, final words. You don't have another question? No? Okay. Well, then, um, yeah, thank you for all your contributions. I think the situation is clear. The EU needs to stop their deterrence policies in the Central Mediterranean Sea, in the Aegean Sea, and inside Europe and everywhere else. They are externalizing their border policies too. We will now see a short music contribution from Mal Eleve. We are very happy that he made it. Um, he performed the song for us. It's Ferries Not Frontex. It's a really important message that we share. And we will see you after this. If you have questions um, in the chat, we will answer them afterwards. Thank you. Hey Leute, schön, dass ihr alle eingeschaltet habt bei United We Talk zu diesem wichtigen Thema. Mein Name ist, wie gesagt, Malilwe und ich kann dazu nur sagen, gerade in Zeiten der Corona-Krise ist es noch mal wichtiger zu zeigen, dass Solidarität keine Grenzen kennt und dass wir nicht in Menschen erster und zweiter Klasse einteilen dürfen. Denn auf der Flucht sein ist kein Verbrechen. Menschenleben zu retten ist kein Verbrechen. Menschen ertrinken zu lassen im Mittelmeer und Menschen in Lager zu stecken, wo sie dem Virus hilflos auf, ausgeliefert sind. Das ist ein Verbrechen. Hier mein Beitrag für euch heute. Danke, dass ich dabei sein kann. Europa setzt auf Abschottung mit Frontex und mit Stacheldraht. Militär und Satelliten, das Mittelmeer ein Massengrab. Grenzen werden dicht gemacht und Menschenrechte abgeschafft. Unzählige Leichen, die die Festung hinterlassen hat. Die Politik sagt, es gibt keine finanziellen Mittel mehr. Banken retten, Panzer lenken, das sind ihnen die Mittel wert. Eurosur und Ankerzentren, Menschen sind hier nichts mehr wert. Es ist Zeit zu handeln, es muss ein neues Kapitel her. Wow, ich kann nicht fassen, was hier gerade passiert. Doch ich werde nicht wegschauen, ich werde nicht resignieren. Es ist Zeit zu handeln, es ist Zeit zu agieren, egal ob ihr uns kriminalisiert. Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen, doch ihr nennt es illegal, ihr lasst sie verrecken und sagt es sei rechtens, denn euch sind Menschen egal. Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen, doch ihr nennt es illegal, nichts kann uns bremsen, durchbrecht alle Grenzen. Check. Horstseehof verfreut sich, Deutschland schiebt wieder in Massen ab. Ihr redet von Asyltourismus, als wäre es eine Klassenfahrt. Ihr nennt die Retter Schlepper, es ist so viel Ignoranz am Start. Keiner von euch weiß, wie es ist, wenn man alles hinterlassen hat. Die Gutbürger schreien ab, saufen und planen den nächsten Brandanschlag. Sie wollen wieder schießen dürfen. Menschen hast als Masterplan, der Geist der Zeit ist so abscheulich, dass ich es nicht fassen kann. Die größte Gefahr ist die von rechts, ich sag nur Passaran. Wow, ich kann nicht fassen, was hier gerade passiert. Zum Glück gibt es noch Menschen, die dagegen protestieren. Gemeinsam sind wir stark, es ist Zeit zu agieren, egal ob ihr uns kriminalisiert. Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen, doch ihr nennt es illegal, ihr lasst sie verrecken und sagt es sei rechtens, denn euch sind Menschen egal. Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen, doch ihr nennt es illegal, nichts kann uns bremsen, durchbrecht alle Grenzen, denn kein Mensch ist illegal. Denn kein Mensch ist illegal. Wir sind zu bequem. Wir stehen da wie gelehnt. Doch wenn wir nichts unternehmen, was sollen wir dann später unseren Kindern erzählen? Wir hätten es nicht gesehen. Sie werden es nicht verstehen. Und sie werden uns nicht glauben, weil es nicht stimmt, also macht was dagegen. L'Europe est en train de paniquer, la militaire n'est militarisée, les réfugiés illégalisés, ceux qui les soutiennent criminalisés. Droits de l'homme, ils sont abîmés, l'inégalité et banalité, il nous faut la solidarité, pas de charité, mais l'égalité. Nenne pour criminalité, fin d'un mettre le maître zum Baden gehen, aber keiner will die Tragik sehen, wo bleibt die Solidarité? C'est wieder rechte Fahnen wehen, weil es nur um Angst und Panik geht. Brände Häuser, Realität, unsere Krankheit, Nationalité. Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen. 
Doch ihr nennt es illegal, ihr lasst sie verrecken und sagt es sei rechtens. Denn euch sind Menschen egal, Menschen zu retten ist kein Verbrechen. Doch ihr nennt es illegal, nichts kann uns bremsen, durchbrecht alle Grenzen. Denn kein Mensch ist illegal. Denn kein Mensch ist illegal. Ich sage leave no one behind. Bleibt aktiv, schaut nicht weg. Seenotrettung ist kein Verbrechen. Dankeschön. Ja, wir haben jetzt ein paar Fragen im Chat. Eine zum Beispiel richtet sich, also bezieht sich auf die... Um speaking in German. I'm sorry. We now have some, uh, some questions in the chat and one is referring on the German uh, rescue vessel. This is uh, probably why I switch to German. The Mare Liberum, which was like uh, kind of sabotaged by the German government recently. And uh, perhaps we can address this question uh, to Berenice because it's a legal question. So could you explain uh, what happened there? Yes, indeed. So this is a new ordinance, a uh, German ordinance that said that uh, now Basically, see some sea rescue vessels such as Marie Liberum, so you mentioned Marie Liberum, but also risk ship and lifeline um, are concerned by this problem, and uh, they now need a certain set certificate, uh, which they didn't need before, and there are no grounds actually for, in in the meaning that there are no any precedents for this. And, um, It's the same like the Dutch government did uh, with the Sea Watch before, no? More or less. Kind of, more or less, indeed. But uh, it only applies for yes, little NGOs such as mm. Marie Liberon, Lifeline, and Risk Ship. Mm. And then we have another uh, question like, uh, what can be done if the EU actors continue to fail to meet the, uh, uh, the commitments? Like, uh, perhaps we can address this. Uh, to the people in the Jitsi talk. So, I don't know, perhaps, uh, Yasha, could you start? I mean, you talked about, like, the, um, the revocation of the Libyan search and rescue zone, and, uh, but this is also, like, uh, addressing Lucia, for example, no? because uh, yeah. the movement in Italy that was uh, kind of challenging uh, Salvini, um, so put pressure uh, on the streets, so uh, let's figure out a little bit the set of resistance that we have. So perhaps, Yasha, can you start? Uh, what can be done uh, yeah. against all these attempts? Yes, this is, this is a very important point because it's very easy to focus on Salvini as the bad man of the situation, but that was... Uh, He did some terrible things, but it, it wasn't outside of what the general framework of what the EU is doing in this field or is organizing. Because in a way, even when, um, even when he, he, he passed some ordinances, in March 2019, so last year, he, he justified it on the basis of some European Commission documents. And he was correct. In fact, because um, because there was the Commissioner for Interior Affairs, who was Paraskevi Michu, who wrote to Fabrice Leggeri, who was the executive director of Frontex, which is the EU border agency, saying that it was fine for them to coordinate uh, Libyan boats from the sky, because Italy was doing it as well as a communications relay, which also brought to light the fact that the Libyan Coast Guard did not have the facilities to carry out the, ta the task that it was carrying out. But at the same time, by holding people at sea for very long periods, instead of helping them to swiftly end, um, to end their rescues, they were effectively kind of keeping people in detention in conditions that could be described as torture. And it was not just the migrants, which is bad enough, but it was also European citizens who were being punished for respecting the law of the sea when states were not doing that. So that's a very important point, and it's very bad that the Spanish government, the Dutch government, the German government didn't protect their own citizens when there was another European government that was abusing them 
in the light of day, and it was even boasting about it. It wasn't keeping it secret. So I think those are some points we could think about. Mm. Thank you very much. Another question was, uh, like, um, what can be done against uh, the actors? Perhaps uh, we can address that uh, to Lucia. I mean, you build a, a great movement. It really reminds me on the Seebrücke, which is uh, translated uh, as uh, Sea Bridge uh, here in Germany, that is very much supporting the sea rescue organizations and uh, the broad, uh, like, covering uh, also the issues of like racism in Germany, stuff like that. So how did you do that? How did you um, connect to the, uh, to the movement uh, in Italy? Um, this was because also the movement was uh, one of the pieces uh, which uh, built up uh, Mediterranean, not the only one, but, uh, but one, one piece for sure. And right now it's, in, it's really, really important to keep this uh, connection uh, and if we think, for example, of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, it, it, it implies for uh, declining it uh, in Italy and in Europe, uh, I think uh, um, that uh, we stand also uh, for migrants crossing the sea in this uh, perspective of anti-racism uh, and anti-fascism and um, I think that this connection can be uh, established, and it's already there, actually. Um, what, we, uh, what we do um, is uh, trying to keep together uh, different levels. So uh, the, the levels that you mentioned, like more political, more con connected to the movement, to uh, other um, instruments, uh, and usually I speak about uh, the legal one because this is uh, my field, let's say, and also in this light, uh, it's important to, to say, as uh, also Yasha underlined, that um, there is uh, an, uh, like um, a line uh, which uh, connects uh, different colors of governments and, and different periods and uh, which unite uh, governmental policies uh, towards migration which uh, which is uh, totally against uh, against their law let's say and and so this is also something that we uh, think can be useful to uh, disrupt uh, the situation and stop the practices that we are uh, denouncing mm. Thank you very much. And it's also, I mean, I can say it uh, for Germany, uh, for example, we have this uh, very great platform, uh, Fragt den Staat, which uh, they have a project in, like, ask the, the government, ask the state. They have a, a sister project for the EU, ask the EU, and they do very much work on, like, finding out facts. So this is also very important to know what's going on. And uh, as we have, like, in Germany, most of the federal states, we have this Freedom of Information uh, Act laws. So th it's possible to find out what's happening and uh, with this information uh, to go to the street. Um, also, like, there's the question, uh, what can people do to support these struggles? I mean, now we heard about the movements. But, uh, of course, uh, like we have several organizations here present today, um, which can be supported as well, but it's uh, probably not only about donations. So could uh, perhaps anybody from, from the organizations explain what possibilities uh, to support uh, do exist? Perhaps we can address that uh, to Seabodge or even to Borderline Europe? I don't know. Or Kiri, well, you wanna... I think maybe Kiri, you can start because the alarm phone is a very strong movement based on the fact that there was no respect of the law conventions in the sea. Maybe you can tell more about the actions the alarm phone has taken and also other struggles you are involved. Yeah. So maybe what I what I want would like to highlight is um, that, uh, for example, in the whole lockdown period um, over Easter, some of the cases um, that uh, Lucia mentioned. Um, with the scandalous involvement of Malta, these were cases that were only that were that were documented through the alarm phone, um, and I think that um, especially when there are no rescue vessels at sea, um, I mean a way to support uh, uh, kind of the, the documenting and the visualization of what's going on at sea is also to turn to actors like the alarm phone who try to directly 
um, relay uh, calls from people who are in distress at sea on social media, for example, but also um, in yeah in more more general media outlets. Um, and I think that this is really important to highlight because, as we've discussed uh, this evening, I mean, there's also uh, kind of a a shrinking space, shrinking opera, opera, operational space for um, uh, actors who are present at sea, but also criminalization. Um, and so in order to continue to make um, these, these um, illegal practices visible, then um, yeah, these, these workers such as the alarm phone have to be uh, amplified, let's say. Thank you, Kiri. I think what um, has been kept out of the loop in this discussion is the situation after arriving in Europe. We don't know, or we know that most of the people that arrive are stuck also in hotspots in Italy, in Greece, and then try to transfer themselves to Germany, where the situation, especially in the camps, has also not been <laughs> the best in the last years, let's say. Uh, Say it like this, uh, Sally, you were in touch with a lot of people that um, were brought back to Libya, but also with people who made the journey over the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, your contacts. Oh, this is um, the website where you can read the whole report later on. Um, but coming back to Sally, we were wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your contacts that you have and what the people are, are telling you after their journey. Not there. Oh, okay. Sally is uh, not here anymore. Probably her internet connection broke down. So then the question goes back to Berenice. We were speaking about activism outside of sea rescue. Maybe you have also additional demands that you would share. Well, actually, I just wanted to reply maybe on one point is that the Sea Watch is uh, five years this year. And we were supposed to exist uh, only one. So at the beginning, it was only a few people. Uh, wanting to launch an operation and uh, launch a ship and to rescue people in the central Mediterranean. And it was supposed to only last one year. And now we are five and clearly we demand the sea rescue program and the, the revocation of the, this Libyan uh, search and rescue region. Um, indeed, Sea Watch is big, a uh, big organization with a lot of uh, volunteer and of course, we, I mean, we need, of, of course, help because uh, having two ve now two vessels, the Sea Watch 3 and soon the Sea Watch 4, and uh, Moonbird and Seabird, it needs uh, to rely on a lot of people. So, yeah, we need help. We need uh, more volunteer. But your first demand in the beginning yeah. was that you yeah. should not exist in the first place, right? Exactly. Because people yeah. should not be forced to go on boats and yeah. be forced to travel on routes like this in the yeah. first place. Mm -hmm. There should be a sea rescue program and sh NGOs should not exist at the first place. They be, the state should not rely on the civil society to save lives in the central Mediterranean. There is another question which is more a technical one. So. Um, uh, is there a cooperation contact between Frontex, uh, like I think we didn't mention Frontex uh, yet, it's yes. the EU agency, the border agency, they also have planes in the Mediterranean uh, and ships, but uh, not as close to the, to the Libyan search and rescue zone as uh, the military vessels. Um, but is there a connection or cooperation between these EU uh, assets, like planes, and the civil rescue fleet? So, do you know that? No. I mean, Frontex is operating not only with planes, but uh, now they, from this or next year on, they will uh, station large drones in the Mediterranean uh, as well. So, I mean, probably the Central Med is the best um, uh, surveilled uh, sea in the world. So, why can't you make use of this information of like satellites, drones, planes? So yes, indeed, we, as I mentioned, with Airborne, we know that uh, they are operate with uh, some airplanes, uh, but uh, I mean, there, there are not any cooperation uh, between them and us because they simply don't want us uh, to be here and monitor their mm. behavior. Well, that's it for now. 
Thank you very much for um, all our guests, Yasha, Lucia, Kiri, and Sally, you already left. Um, this is the end of the part of the discussion of the report, and we will now go over to see the show with the cat, the 14 minutes video that will bring us scratchy transnational news about the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. After a short break, we are back with our show. The show with the cat. We are here today in Covio Studios. This show is part of the transnational network of Covio.info. With me today in the studio for moderation, we have Dr. X Cat's cat, as well as the Riot Cat and myself, Ren Strike Cat. Before we start, some info about us. From now on, we plan to release our news format bi weekly, so feel free to share infos with us and send us content you want to see as part of this show. Mail it to our production office, coview at riseup.net. We now start with an update on COVID-19. COVID-19 and the situation about it is less in the media. At least in Western media, there's less information about what is going on in a world related to Corona. Even if people in China or places in places like Austria and Germany to party in public space and to join demonstrations in masses, it does not mean we did overcome the effects of the virus. It is important to check the situation in countries like Brazil and Mexico. It's important to negotiate a post-corona society in the clear understanding that the applause given for the system-relevant work will neither pay the rent nor that the neoliberal capitalist politics can be our future. The housing situation is still unsolved for thousands of people who can't pay their rent. This could trigger a massive wave of evictions and people lose their homes. The health sector needs to change for better. There needs to be a global solidarity and support with the economical situations of many. We currently have the danger of Corona making all gaps within society bigger. From the gender pay cap to the general income difference in between rich and poor as well as the global, as globally the Western countries profiting within the crisis. Let the rich pay for COVID-19. Our focus must therefore shift towards the areas where there is not yet support given, like the support of people doing sex work is not going well. And a whole sectors like culture and artwork are in many areas of the world still left without support. Therefore, we support all kinds of actions and manifestations that makes this gap visible. And now, some short news. COVID fees. Also related to the topic, we demand that all COVID-19 fees to be removed. More and more decisions by court show that in many cases there was no legal ground for the fees given by out by police. While people with secure income have enough space in their villa, private parks or yachts to practice physical distancing, people in dramatic financial circumstances are actually threatened by the high penalties. Numerous official acts of punishments were presumably unlawful and were also selective. Next topic. We'll now come up with an event tip. On distance festival. Prides in over 500 cities around the world have been cancelled due to the coronavirus. For millions of people, Pride events represent a precious moment of visibility, community and solidarity. Pride boosts our movement and our community, powering our batteries for the coming year. Without it, our sense of belonging, our visibility, our advocacy and our ability to support each other are all weakened. But we don't need up to give on Pride 2020 around the world. The power of digital gives us the chance to come together for Pride in spirit, if not with our bodies. It allows us to respect physical distancing, but embrace social and community cohesion. It allows us to celebrate who we are and who we love across borders and cultures. This is hashtag undistance. Check out the awesome lineup in the program in June to July 2020 online on undistance.weareallout.org. We now come up with a little more sad story. Activist updates, new tactics. 
Signal, our old favorite security messenger app, has a new feature. Right in the time of the uprisings in the US, the app brings a new face blurring option. So our protests can stay visible and our faces can stay protected. If you don't use Signal yet, go and download it. Difficult times always need new strategies. Therefore, we clearly support this innovative use of gardening tools. But see for yourself. Um, Black Lives Matter is a worldwide movement started by the Sikh justice for George Floyd, a black man killed in Minneapolis by a policeman. I can't breathe have been one of his last words before his death. The horrible scenes were filmed by many civilists and started a worldwide fight and movement. People are demonstrating for justice and protests as well as riots fill the streets in the US. Let's check what's happening with the unicorn riots with the topic Black Lives Matter. Unicorn Riot. The current protest once again shows the importance of self-organized media coverage and the independent media work. The media collective Unicorn Riots, whose work we already did feature in other shows of us, was there in the beginning. They did cover the protest in a good way, respecting if activists did not want to show their fair faces. Unicorn Riot started to become a trend in the U US on Twitter for some days, and their number of followers climbed from around 80,000 to 200,000 in a few days. They provide a solid coverage about what is happening in Minnesota and other places. Check out their website and their social media accounts. And here we have a short in-view on their news coverage. Their website can be found under unicordriot.ninja. Yeah, you're right. In yeah, Chicago, they, they, they would they actually take shoes. you to an alley and fuck you up yeah, and then let you go. Seriously though, we're we're in the middle of, um, this was a peaceful protest that's going on here right now. And then these guys came up the street all of a sudden and decided to shoot rubber bullets at us. And they shot their little rubber bullets. Even I got hit in the leg with one. And I'm just out here as an old dude just recording shit and making sure that our business down on East Lake Street or West Lake Street is protected. And seeing how it's being protected. I ain't got no business being out here, but after two days of seeing this chaos and the lack of our government involvement, I was like, no, 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 no. I need to get out there and make sure and see what the fuck is going on. But now that I get out and see what's going on, I realize why the third precinct was burnt down. It wasn't burnt down because people were mad at the police, it was burnt down because the police were mad at the people. One scene has filled the timeline in the last weeks. The 18-foot-tall statue of the 17th century slave trader in Bristol was turned down by Bristol Harbor. It was the statue of Everett Colossal who made money by slavery and who spent his wealth to the city. Time magazine suggested that Colston transported 84,500 kidnapped African men, women and children during the tenure of this company table the governor. Almost 20,000 of the enslaved individuals died on a cruel voyage across the Atlantic. The figure has since then been retrieved by officials. It has been said, been displayed on Bristol's museum alongside the blaze cut of the Black Lives Matter metal protesters in the crowd when it was torn down. Liverpool Institution added, the representation of Edward Colston was highly contagious and offensive to many. And to bring in him down, it is an important note that we are not erasing history, but instead making history.
that's why we need to have a chat with white people. A comment by mental illness activist Rafaela Mancuso from Canada. The mental illness activist from Panda Canada got a message for other white people in behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of white people join it, but how do they really help? That's the question Rafaela takes. She says that we as white people benefit directly or indirectly from white privilege and systematic racism. Yes, we still have a hard life, and yes, we can also have struggles, but it has nothing to do with the color of the thick skin. In her Instagram video, she tells how Black Lives Matter becomes a movement and does not stay a moment. For all of you who are active on social media, listen up. Capitol Hill, built many self-organized police-free zones. A flourishing autonomous zone is growing in the Capitol Hill, Seattle neighborhood after police vacant uh, office following over a week of violent clashes and rioting. Capitol Hill is the historic queer neighborhood and back in the days it were the punks and the musicians and all, where all the freaks left. It pitched the battles around Ferguson in 2014-15, Occupy in 2011-12 and the anti-police movement in 2011-10 saw a majority of these conflicts on the hill. It has always been our neighborhood. But as what, what is happening in literally every other city in the US and worldwide, rapid gentrification and democratic shifts kicked out everyone except um, those who have a lot of money. It turned into corporatized Pride Month and the neighborhood was built into a tech corridor. Currently, these streets are ours again. But what comes with the next battle? And the question remains, what is autonomy? This is an outtake from an interview about Capitol Hill. Check out all the other infos on itsgoingdown.org backslash get in the zone. We have a new profile for you to follow up. Movements for justice and equality rights took place since the Second World War, or even longer. Since the corona pandemic, activism has more than ever become a hashtag invasion. But it is on us to not let fear and rules overcome our rights and to not be controlled by taking of our freedom of voices and choices. There have been many role models in foreign times of activism, which should be an example for us to not stop the protest, no matter what. No matter what, because working class history posts about these stories on Twitter and Instagram. You should check them out. Like one story posted about the Algerian Black Spring Rebellion peaked as nearly a million demonstrators marched in Algiers. The uprising began two months before after the police murder of a young man and swept the country. Amazigh people, commonly known as Berber, in Kabylia and elsewhere demanding democratic and cultural rights. Check out Working Class History for more posts. Activism and process are a long game. It doesn't always work. The battles feel like they're never quite over. And sometimes it takes a generation for a movement to come to fruition. But you know what definitely does not work at all? Doing nothing. This is our tweet of the week by Eva Sida. But action, what can I do? Sag Litsky get us some good examples of what everybody can do and dropped a fitting graphics in a scene group on Facebook right when the current wave of Black Lives Matters took the street. We support the approach to use all forms of protest available, to use the full variety from direct action, self-care to entertainment. Find your options and do stuff. One example for this is community building. We'll end our show with this. Check out more infos via cycleski.com backslash home backslash but what can I do? Building communities. Ending your role in individualism can be very powerful. Change will not happen unless people unify together together to demand it. Unionize, strike, host potlucks, live together with like-minded people. People are hugely divided in the world right now, but climate change is an excellent way to have a common enemy to fight together against. So, do shit. See you in two weeks. CoView19 is part of the CoView Studios, a German initiative to respond to the political and social impact of the current pandemic and the accompanying measurements. The group is following the idea of solidarity when the health of many is at risk. What we will see now is a preview of their following project that calls for a transnational 
collaboration. But let's see for yourself. Within Covio, we are currently working on a new step of networking. Covio found itself as a direct response to the COVID-19 crisis. Now we go beyond this. We see that there is a need to work together, beyond borders and transnational. The negotiation of a post-COVID-19 society is already happening. And it does not look like it's going to be a more just world than before. Therefore, we call activists, culture workers, civil society, communities, workers of all sectors, artists, organized groups who are structured non-hierarchical to join in. Let's form a big network to exchange and to work together. Get in contact with us if you're interested in this. Together, we are stronger. Let's learn from each other. Kovio brings into this collaboration the skills and media platforms developed within the crisis. We join in with cats, newspapers and our work on various platforms. What can you bring into the transnational network? Let us know. Kovio at riseup.net. Especially during the past weeks and months, the cruelty of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy became even more visible than it had been before. As public health systems, economies and welfare states couldn't provide basic needs for all before and now can't handle the corona pandemic, people are suffering increasingly and experiencing oppression and violence. Even new dimensions of repression, authoritarian politics abuse, discrimination and police violence are worsening the situations for those who were already marginalized in society. Though many groups, movements and individuals around the world are fighting against this injustice, in various contexts, countries and fields, people are organizing and fighting for just societies. Many of the struggles are similar like they have similar goals or face similar difficulties and obstacles. But now it seems extremely important to create and use a transnational momentum for lasting change. As activist groups, individuals and movements, it is most of the times hard to act alone. Alliances, structures and networks are fundamental to create lasting change and emancipation. This creation needs strategies and resources and solidarity structures. As a political watch group and platform that was founded in response to the authoritarian developments in the merge of the corona crisis, CoView wants to support transnational responses, actions and strategies. In the coming months, we want to create a space and network for initiatives, for groups, movements and individuals who want to exchange about strategies and structures, support and inspire each other. So let's connect act and organize in solidarity. Let us know what you are up to. What are your ideas for networking? How can we overcome capitalism, patriarchy and white supremacy and all forms of oppression? How can a good life for all of us can become reality? What is your utopia? Contact us if you have questions join into the decentral collaborative and solidarity network. Let's support each other in our struggles and on the stony path towards utopia. Mail to us coview at riseup.net. See you in the digital alleys and on the streets. So this was uh, our English part of the evening. We will now switch to German. We will talk about the logbook um, Uh, Freedom Now, Logbuch Freiheit. Wie gewohnt kommt jetzt das Video von uh, Linus Neumann und Lea Beckmann. Linus uh, vom Chaos Computer Club und Lea von der Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte. Das Logbuch Freiheit ist ein uh, Spin-off vom Logbuch Netzpolitik. Das macht auch Linus uh, zusammen mit uh, Tim Pritloff. Die heutige Ausgabe geht um Mobiltelefone von Geflüchteten. Dafür vielleicht noch mal kurzer Exkurs. Also wie sich äh, alle wahrscheinlich vorstellen können, ist das Handy von Menschen auf der Flucht ein extrem wichtiges Gerät, wo im Prinzip das ganze Leben gespeichert ist. Also Fotos, ähm, Kontakte und man kann natürlich auch damit telefonieren nach Hause und, ähm, oder sich Hilfe holen. 
Und dieses Handy weckt natürlich auch große Begehrlichkeiten bei den Verfolgungsbehörden, also bei der Strafverfolgung oder bei der Verhinderung vom Grenzübertritt. Handys werden ausgelesen, um zum Beispiel Fluchthelfer zu finden. Und darum geht es in der Ausgabe jetzt aber nicht, sondern es geht darum, wie sich das Behörden in Deutschland zunutze machen, also die Asylbehörden, konkret das BAMF, die zuständig sind für die Asylanträge, also die ist das Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge und wie die die Handys auswerten, auslesen, um daraus Schlüsse zu ziehen, beispielsweise auf die Herkunft der Personen und wie die das machen und welche Daten ausgewertet werden, das erklären euch jetzt Linus Neumann und Lea Beckmann im Logbuch Freiheit. Logbuchfreiheit mit der neunten Folge. Heute wollen wir uns mit der Digitalisierung der Migrationskontrolle in Deutschland auseinandersetzen. Wie wir wissen, Kriege und humanitäre Katastrophen zwingen Menschen in die Flucht und Europa möchte sich dagegen zur Wehr setzen mit allen möglichen Mitteln von Überwachung bis hin zur Bewaffnung. Diese Außengrenzenkontrollen in Europa werden auch zusehends digitalisiert. Ja, auch hier findet eine Modernisierung statt und nicht nur an diesen Grenzen, sondern auch direkt in Deutschland. Darüber möchte ich heute mit Lea sprechen, die diese Prozesse als Vertreterin der Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte kritisch begleitet. Kritisch begleiten heißt bei Juristen klagend. <lacht> Lea, Spoiler. Äh, was, pass <lacht> was, was passiert an Digitalisierung in der Migrationskontrolle in Deutschland. Also die Behörde, die dafür zentral zuständig ist für Migration in Deutschland, ist das Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge. Und die äh, gerieren sich tatsächlich seit Jahren als so Vorreiter in der Digitalisierung und haben diverse Digitalisierungsprojekte. Und dazu gehört zum Beispiel, dass die auch digitalisiert haben, die Transliteration arabischer Namen, also die Umwandlung von arabischen Schriftzeichen in lateinische Schriftzeichen, also zum Teil vielleicht noch Projekte, die irgendwie auch ganz sinnvoll erscheinen. Dann aber zum Beispiel auch ähm, eine Dialekterkennung, also wenn äh, Geflüchtete sich hier registrieren und ähm, angeben, aus dem arabischen Land zu kommen, dann müssen die so eine zweiminütige Sprachprobe in so einen Sprachhörer äh, sprechen und der kann dann angeblich sagen, ob das wirklich ein arabischer Dialekt ist oder eben nicht. Ähm, und ganz zentral, darum wird es jetzt gleich auch weitergehen, die Handydatenauswertung, also das BAMF äh, wertet Handydaten von Geflüchteten aus äh, im Zusammenhang mit der Bearbeitung von Asylanträgen. Und es gibt noch diverse andere Projekte, die das BAMF plant, die meines Wissens Stands nach aber noch nicht im Betrieb sind. Also diese vier Maßnahmen, die du jetzt erkannt hast, soll, äh, benannt hast, sollen alle dem Zweck dienen, die Herkunft einer Person zu bestimmen. Also diese Transliteration von Namen, das soll eben verhindern, dass es zu Verwechslungen kommen ist. Also insgesamt und auch mit den weiteren geplanten Digitalisierungsprojekten geht es ein bisschen darum, die, also die Asylverfahren schneller und effizienter zu gestalten und die Qualität der Asylentscheidung zu erhöhen. So würde das BAMF das jetzt erstmal positiv formulieren. Und, äh, und wie machen Sie das jetzt mit einer Handydatenauswertung? Was genau passiert da? Also die Handydatenauswertung, äh, wir haben uns übrigens das ein bisschen genauer angeschaut, gemeinsam mit einer Journalistin, Anna Biselli. Wer das also im, wen das im Detail interessiert, kann das gerne nachlesen. Bei Netzpolitik.org Netzpolitik .org oder auf unserer, Sitze, auf unserer Seite Freiheitsrechte. Org. Und zwar ist es so, dass also von den Geflüchteten, die in Deutschland ankommen, ungefähr 50 Prozent keinen Pass haben. Das kann ganz unterschiedliche Gründe haben. Also unter, äh, unter anderem kann das mit dem Urkundenwesen im Herkunftsland zu, äh, Herkunftsländern zu tun haben, dass also diese Urkunden hier einfach gar nicht an, anerkannt werden oder dass nicht alle Menschen dort Pässe haben. Das kann auch mit der individuellen Fluchtgeschichte zu tun haben. Und dann ist erstmal also das legitime Ansinnen des Staates, wenn eine Person dann angibt, eine bestimmte Identität zu haben und aus einem Land zu kommen, das zu überprüfen. Und das passiert im Normalfall über Fragen in der Anhörung im Asylverfahren, wo also auch Regionalwissen zum Beispiel abgefragt wird. Also da wird ganz genau nachgefragt, wenn jemand sagt, er kommt aus einer bestimmten Stadt, dann wird da gefragt, wenn man dann in Richtung Norden fährt, was kommt dann und so. Und seit 2017 gibt es auch die Handydatenauswertung, die also eine Möglichkeit sein soll, gemachte Angaben von Personen zu überprüfen, die keinen Pass haben. Und ähm, in Betracht kommt das, also das BAMF macht das bei Erstanträgen, ähm, aber auch in Überprüfungsverfahren. Also es werden auch also in getroffene Asylentscheidungen nochmal wieder überprüft. Und wenn wir jetzt davon ausgehen, dass ungefähr 50 Prozent ohne Pass oder Identitätspapiere ankommen, und 2018, 2019, das jetzt also schon lief, dann hätte das BAMF potenziell also in etwa bei 260.000 geflüchteten Handydaten auswerten können. Tatsächlich hat es das wohl unter 30.000 Mal versucht. Okay, ist das jetzt zu 
zu kritisieren, dass sie es so selten gemacht haben oder ist das gut? Was kam denn eigentlich dabei raus bei diesen 30.000 Anwendungen? Ja, es ist erstmal interessant, dass das dann quasi nur in 30.000 Fällen, also ich finde das immer noch sehr, sehr viele Fälle passiert, aber es ist einfach eine interessante äh, Feststellung zu sehen ähm, und warum das so ist, da können wir auch nur so ein bisschen drüber spekulieren, aber ich glaube, dass das auch, also wahrscheinlich damit zu tun haben, dass Mitarbeiter in, im BAMF vielleicht auch ein bisschen technikskeptisch sind, aber eben auch vielleicht, dass sie einfach das unsinnig finden und Quatsch und dann auch nicht anwenden, denn das liegt in der Entscheidung der einzelnen Personen. Oder, oder kann ja vielleicht auch sein, vielleicht haben die kein Telefon dabei oder so. Ne? Ich, also ich kann mir vorstellen, so ein digitales Verfahren muss doch irgendwie so eine Art Mindestmenge an, an Daten auch überhaupt produzieren, damit es eine Aussagekraft hat, oder? Genau, das sind zwei unterschiedliche Sachen. Ne? Einmal ist es natürlich tatsächlich so, dass Geflüchtete zum Teil kein Handy dabei haben oder auch angeben, keins zu haben. Das mag zum Teil auch nicht richtig sein. Also da spricht sich eben auch um diese Handydatenauswertung. Und andererseits ist es tatsächlich so, das sieht man jetzt auch in den Handydatenauswertungen, die das BAMF macht, dass also das zum Teil scheitert in einem Viertel der Fälle und dass es dann aber auch zum Teil einfach unbrauchbare Ergebnisse produziert, nämlich zum Beispiel, weil das Handy zu neu ist und dazu kleine Datensätze drauf sind, die dann einfach keine Aussagekraft entwickeln können. Und ähm, also was kam dabei raus? Ich habe ja schon gesagt, beim Viertel äh, scheitert es und bei denen, wo es quasi dann durchgegangen ist, die Handydatenauswertungen und ähm, da ist es so, dass 58 bis 64 Prozent zwischen 2018 und 2019 unbrauchbare Ergebnisse herausgebracht haben. Also irgendwie, selbst das BAMF sieht ein, kann man nichts mit anfangen. Und in 34 bis 40 Prozent der Fälle hat es die gemachten Angaben zur Herkunft und Identität einfach bestätigt. Also da ähm, passte das zusammen, was die Person angegeben hat. Und nur in zwei Prozent der Fälle, konstant 2018, 2019, hat das dann einen Widerspruch aufgedeckt zwischen den gemachten Angaben zur Identität und Herkunft und dem, was diese Handy-Auswertung da ähm, produziert hat. Äh, das, wenn ich das richtig sehe, ist das doch, wenn es nur so selten ein Widerspruch zeigt, würde ich das jetzt erstmal als eine Bestätigung der Legitimität der Anträge sehen. Genau, also das stellt Geflüchteten in Deutschland ein super gutes Zeugnis aus eigentlich und man kann vielleicht so festhalten, dass die Gründe, aus denen man das Ganze ja eingeführt hat, eigentlich nicht greifen. Also man hat das eingeführt, weil man behauptet hat, ohne irgendeine empirische Datenbasis, dass Geflüchtete eben lügen, was ihre Herkunft angeht, um damit entweder sich einen Aufenthaltstitel zu erschleichen, also Asylmissbrauch, oder um Abschiebungen zu verhindern. Und wie viel hat der Spaß gekostet? Der Spaß hat ähm, also jetzt bis Ablauf dieses Jahres schon irgendwie 11 Millionen Euro gekostet. Da muss man jedes Jahr laufen da irgendwie drei bis vier Millionen weiter rein, ähm, weil das ja dauerhaft aktualisiert werden muss. Ähm, und wenn man das einmal genau umrechnet, also zwischen den 30.000 versuchten Fällen, dann hat das ja zum Teil nicht geklappt, dann war das unbrauchbar, bla 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 bla. Da sind ungefähr 118 Fälle rausgekommen, wo es also ein Indiz gab, dass da falsche Angaben gemacht worden sind. 118 Fälle zwischen 2018 und 2019 und das hat eben 11 Millionen Euro gekostet. Ah, Solide. Super. Aber äh, wir interessieren uns nicht nur fürs Geld, sondern eigentlich überhaupt nicht so sehr fürs Geld. Wie schätzt ihr das denn rechtlich ein und also kommt das BAMF damit durch, sowas zu machen? Also von der rechtlichen Seite kann man sagen, ist unsere Einschätzung und die wird weit geteilt und zwar auch von RichterInnenvereinigungen, ähm, dass das unverhältnismäßig ist. Denn man muss ja immer gegenüberstellen, ähm, wie stark wird hier in Grundrechte eingegriffen und dann sagt ja diese Verhältnismäßigkeitsprüfung immer, was bringt es eigentlich jetzt an Erkenntnisgewinn zu diesem Zweck, für den das läuft und äh, ist das also insgesamt, ergibt das Sinn eigentlich? Ne? Und da muss man eben sagen, es greift massiv in Grundrechte ein. Also jeder, der sein Handy irgendwo rüberreicht, wird merken ähm, und darüber nachdenken, was da alles für Daten drauf sind. Also massive Rechtseingriffe und die sind äh, einfach insgesamt unbrauchbar. Also ähm, die dienen einem migrationspolitischen Zweck, nämlich hier also Abschiebungen durchsetzen zu können insbesondere, den sie aber kaum erfüllen, also weil das einfach in so wenigen Fällen überhaupt nur eine Indizwirkung dahingehend ausgibt. Ähm, die untersuchten Indikatoren, das ist ja vielleicht auch noch interessant, das haben wir noch nicht besprochen, was die sich eigentlich genau angucken für Daten, ähm, die sind ziemlich ungeeignet meiner Meinung nach auch. Also die gucken sich zum Beispiel an Ländervorwahlen von Kontakten in ein- und ausgehenden Anrufen, von Kontakten und in Nachrichten. Und äh, das kann, also auf den ersten Blick denkt man so, okay, das ist ja legitim, man wird ja vielleicht, wenn man aus Syrien kommt, mit ganz vielen SyrerInnen telefonieren, aber wenn man gerade jemand ist, der auf der Flucht ist, dann glaube ich, ist das umso mehr unplausibel, dass das wirklich eine äh, Aussage trifft, darüber, wo eine Person herkommt, weil das sind Leute, die sind auf der Flucht aus einer äh, Situation, in, also die sie aus dem Land getrieben hat, äh, bei denen sind Freunde und Angehörige womöglich selbst längst nicht mehr im Land, die haben vielleicht über die Fluchtgeschichte Leute kennengelernt, die in ganz anderen Ländern gelandet sind und sind schließlich jetzt vielleicht auch schon seit Jahren im 
im Gastland und haben auch hier ihre Kontakte. Also es wird so ein Nutzungsverhalten ausgewertet, das echt sehr bedingt nur Aussagekraft treffen kann über äh, Herkunft und Identität einer Person. Und die arbeiten halt ganz viel äh, mit Ländervorwahlen zum Beispiel. Das ist ja relativ schwach. Ich hätte jetzt gedacht, die gucken sich zum Beispiel GPS-Metadaten in Fotos an oder sowas. Äh, genau, Lokationsdaten gucken die sich auch an in Apps und äh, Fotos zeichnen die dann auf so einer Karte ein. Da ist aber auch nicht ganz klar, welche Apps die genau auswerten. Also all diese Informationen, das wissen wir einfach nicht so genau, was sie sich da angucken, ne? weil das BAMF ziemlich mauert und das, also, da ist so ein gewisses Fragezeichen dran. Lokationsdaten gucken sich auch an und sie gucken sich an Sprache äh, in Nachrichten, ähm, die man schickt. Da haben sie so eine ganz tolle Software, die jede Sprache der Welt sofort erkennt. Ähm, ohne Angaben also über die Algorithmen und die äh, Fehlerquotienten. Also wir wissen einfach nicht, wie valide das ist, was da rauskommt. Nur um das mal in, also das ist äh, etwas, was in, was man mit einer deutschen Bürgerin ähm, nur unter einem Richterinnenbeschluss machen könnte oder bei, und auch dann glaube ich nur bei Verdacht auf irgendwie wirklich schwere Straftaten, dass man in die Nachrichten auf einem Gerät äh, schaut ne, und sich irgendwie guckt, wer sind überhaupt deine Kontakte, die du in diesem Telefon gespeichert hat, das hast und so, das könntest du mit einer deutschen Bundesbürgerin aber nicht machen. Ja, passiert nicht. Also die einzigen anderen Situationen in Deutschland, wo man Handy, so auf Handydaten zugreift, sind ähm, also Strafverfolgung und jetzt zum Teil auch in der Gefahrenabwehr. Das sind ja diese großen Diskussionen um die Reform des Polizeigesetzes gewesen, dass jetzt auch so Spähsoftware eingesetzt wird zur Gefahrenabwehr. Und da geht es dann aber auch um die Verhütung schwerer Straftaten. Und auch das wird ja schon sehr kritisiert. Und hier, man muss einräumen, dass die im ne also nicht in den Inhalte der Nachrichten gucken, angeblich, aber sie greifen erstmal so einen kompletten Rohdatensatz ab, analysieren das dann und alles danach ist halt so ein bisschen Vertrauen. Ne? Also deswegen, okay, in den Berichten nachher sind keine inhaltlichen Daten drin, aber erstmal ist da, läuft das alles halt durch den Computer im BAMF und das ist auch schon gruselig. So. Und das, klar, das ist eine riesen Diskrepanz zwischen dem, was man an rechten ähm, Deutschen zugesteht und äh, Geflüchteten. So, ihr habt drei Klagen dagegen laufen. Genau, wir haben jetzt im Mai drei Klagen anhängig gemacht. Wir sind jetzt also auf, der Lam auf dem langen Weg nach Karlsruhe und hoffen, das Gesetz überprüfen zu können. Und das ist, äh, wenn ich das richtig sehe, das ist genau deine Arbeit. Ne? Das ja. ist das, was, womit du dich jeden Tag beschäftigst. Unter anderem, ja. <lacht> Dann denke ich, ja, wer das für einen unterstützenswerten Ansatz hält, ist sicherlich gut beraten, die Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte mit Spenden zu unterstützen. Das könnt ihr unter freiheitsrechte.org, unseren kleinen Podcast hier, könnt ihr auf äh, logbuch-freiheit und auf YouTube abonnieren. Links dazu findet ihr auch in den Shownotes. Und das ist erstmal unser Dank und unser Tschüss an unsere Zuschauerinnen bei United We Talk. Tschüss. Und ich würde sagen, weil dieses Thema äh, spannend und interessant ist, machen wir nochmal ganz kurz ein bisschen weiter, zumindest für uns bei YouTube. Welche drei Klagen sind denn da jetzt genau anhängig? Ja, wir können noch kurz ähm, dazu ergänzen, dass also das Mobiltelefon von Geflüchteten eben auf dem Weg nach, äh, also in das Land, wo dann ein Asylantrag gestellt wird, natürlich auch eine große Rolle spielt. Ein besonders perfides Projekt wird gerade in Griechenland entwickelt und getestet, beziehungsweise an der griechisch-bulgarischen Grenze. Die Europäische Union finanziert das wo ähm, im Prinzip Funkzellenabfragen an der Grenze gemacht werden. Also da gibt es nicht nur Bewegungsdetektoren oder so ähm, Geräuschmessdetektoren, äh, um unerlaubte Grenzübertritte in dortigen bewaldeten Gebiet festzustellen, sondern auch, wenn sich ein Handy in eine Funkzelle einbucht, wo normalerweise niemand ist außer der Förster. Also solche Projekte gibt es oder was eben auch bekannt ist, ist, dass ähm, zum Beispiel auf dem Weg äh, auf der sogenannten Balkanroute beispielsweise in vielen Fällen die Handys von Geflüchteten äh, einfach äh, von den Grenzbeamten weggenommen werden, um die einfach irgendwie zu bestrafen. Also so ein super herabwürdigendes Verhalten, die Handys kaputt gemacht werden ähm, oder mit dem Schraubenzieher zum Beispiel die Ladebuchse kaputt gemacht wird beispielsweise. Genau, so viel thematisch, inhaltlich von uns. Ja, vielen Dank, dass ihr heute dabei wart. Jetzt unser letzte, die letzten 15 Minuten auf Deutsch. Die Webseite, die wir euch vorhin angezeigt haben, auf der ihr nochmal den ganzen Report nachlesen könnt. Ihr könnt euch die Videos nochmal angucken, die hoffentlich gleich hinter mir eingeblendet wird. Genau, da seht ihr sie nochmal, eulibia.info. Checkt das aus, verfolgt weiter die Arbeit von den Organisationen, die heute hier dabei wart. 
waren ähm, vielen Dank nochmal an alle, die mit uns gesprochen haben, sich eingeschaltet haben, sogar aus Uganda. Ähm, Sally, still sorry that, you, that we missed you in the end. Ähm, <lacht> genau, also bleibt äh, stark und bleibt resistant und wir sehen uns bald wieder nächste Woche zur nächsten Sendung von United We Talk. Einen schönen Abend euch allen noch und vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen. Tschüss. Tschüss.